Okay, we're still missing a few people, um, but I think we're going to get started and hope that everyone else shows up. Um, link worked without a problem, so you're all able to join, so that should be good. Okay, so first, before we get started, um, we're obviously online today. I am not allowed to return to campus until next week, um, so I'm in the five-day quarantine, so we'll be on Zoom on Friday as well, um, which is... Yeah, which is better anyway. So I have a chance to recover before I get back. So we will be on Zoom. It looks like I have to share a new link each time. There's not like a, a set link. There used to be a set room that I could have on Zoom, but that's changing. So I will share that with you on Friday before class. Do any of you have any questions or announcements? Anything that we should know about happening on campus or anything I can clarify about the class? And feel free, you can either raise your hand and I should see it on Zoom and call you or just jump in if I don't. Uh, yeah, Grace. Um, Sociology Club is meeting today and we're doing a Black History Month Jeopardy tonight in, Hart in Hartwell in room 221. I'm pretty sure from five to six. Yeah, it's a cool event that's organized. And I think maybe there's another club that's helping out. Is that right? Yeah, we're collaborating with men of color. Yeah, so um, there's a cool event happening five to six in Hartwell. If you have any interest at all, um, want to check out the club or just want to participate in the event, um, stop by and feel free to come and go. It's not like if you're there, you're stuck there or anything like that. Um, okay, let me just, there's a few more people still joining. All right, any other announcements? Okay, for a few people who just joined, the one announcement so far was Grace pointed out Social Club is having an event from five to six. There is a Jeopardy for Black History Month. Um, so participate if you can. All right, still, all right, people are still popping on it. So I'm trying to wait before I do any announcements that I really want everyone to hear. Okay. Um, all right, things that I want to tell you. First, sorry again for being online. Um, I wish I didn't have COVID, I wish we were in person. And some of you, I think two of you, I still owe an email. So sorry if I was a little slow in responding to your email questions. Um, things that I want to make sure we're up to date on. So there are currently two in-class writings that you should be paying attention to. First one is the final project. So you all should have submitted your ideas for the final project. I think it's still some of you have to do that. I will take that until Friday. You can still get full credit up until Friday. After Friday, I will send out an email with a list of all the ideas. I won't say who came up with them, but a list of all the ideas that you have. What I want you to do by Monday is just take a look at the list and see what interests you. You don't have to finalize it. On Monday, I will put everything on the board and we'll start to break them down into categories. And we'll try to get down to four categories. So that will be the goal. So take a look at the list, maybe five categories, but take a look at the list before Monday, more importantly, before Friday, make sure you've submitted that assignment. Up until then, up until then I will take your work. The other in-class writing, and this was my fault, I was a little bit out of it um, last few days. We have an in-class writing on inclusive masculinity, which is going to be due before next class, hopefully before the end of today. What I want you to do is take the idea from inclusive masculinity that I lectured on, the video I sent out, and just using that pink cleats reading, just choose two examples that you think illustrate the idea of inclusive masculinity. If you already did the in-class writing, which some of you did using what the assignment said before, you will receive full credit. I'm actually doing an easier version of it. Um, it well, I don't know if it's easier, but so if you already did it, don't redo it, but you'll get credit, but that's what I want you to do. So both of those will be due before Friday. Just making sure one, that you have an idea, you're brainstorming about the final project, two, that you're understanding what inclusive masculinity is. Up, into this, up to this point, we've, we're starting to work through a few different models for understanding the relationship uh, or the power that masculinity has in society and, start, and trying to understand the relationship between men and people, anyone who performs masculinity in society. First model that we have to know, hegemonic masculinity, mapping out the power relations that exist. Second approach, this idea of inclusive masculinity, which is what I lectured on the video, with the reading on for Monday and the video. Um, and I'll have you help me understand that in a second. Third model, hybrid mas masculinity. Um, uh, Juan, I'm already recording this, so I see that you're requesting to record this, but I'm already recording and we'll share it after. 
All right. Um, okay. Uh, so we have inclusive. So we've got hegemonic masculinity. We've got inclusive masculinity. We have hybrid masculinity. Um, inclusive and hybrid both build on hegemonic in different ways. So that's what we're talking about today. And then next class, you're going to get something a little bit different. So you're going to read a short article that I co-authored with a scholar in masculinity from Australia. And we're presenting the idea of looking at masculinity as affect. It's going to be a little bit confusing. The examples, I hope, make sense. But the theory itself is a little confusing. So do the reading. And then on Friday, we'll work through that. By the end of Friday, we'll have four different ways of understanding masculinity. The in-class reading, which you will do after class on Friday, is you're just going to think about those different models. And you're going to say, here's the one that seems to fit what I've seen in the world. You can't get it wrong. I just want you to choose one and try to tell me why. I'm curious what resonates with you. All of them are tools. None of them are saying this has to be right, but they do disagree with each other sometimes. So I just want to see what you think. Um, final thing that I want to say is discussion leading. All of you have to lead technically how many times during the semester? Four. So the goal is to read four, to, to be a discussion leader four times. There's a lot of people in the class. I'm changing it to three to make life a little bit easier for you. Um, but with changing it to three, I'm giving you the option of replacing one of your discussion leading grades if you don't like it. So say you lead three times, second time you lead, you get, I don't know, C plus, B minus, you're not thrilled with it, then just lead a fourth time and that will replace that grade. So you already signed up for fourth times, four times. If you lead three times and you're happy with your grade, you're done for the semester. So just a way to make life a little bit easier for you. Um, it also makes it so I won't feel bad giving you a lower grade because you can replace it and it's already set up. So it makes makes it easier for me. Um, and I think it takes the stress off because you do less work, but you know you can replace one. All right. So let's think about what we're doing with these different ideas of inclusive masculinity and hybrid masculinity. The concept of hegemonic masculinity, which is mapping out, again, the power relations in society to some degree was built on this idea that the, the defining quality of the subordinate masculinity, right? The group that, that the hegemonic often presented themselves in contrast to, it was built in homophobia. And there were a lot of surveys that back this up. Surveys throughout, sorry, it's making someone else in the room. Surveys throughout the 70s, throughout the 80s, throughout the early 90s, demonstrated over and over that people who identified as men had high rates of homophobia and much higher rates in contrast to people who identified as women. So there was a lot of just really basic on the surface level data to show that this claim that a central aspect of masculinity was homophobia or central aspect of dominant versions of masculine society was homophobia. Surveys began to show throughout the 90s and especially early 2000s that this started to shift there became less of a stigma based on sexuality, right? It still existed. There's no one denying that it doesn't exist and it's not still a powerful, it doesn't have a powerful effect. But we see that shift start to occur. Inclusive masculinity and hybrid masculinity are both responses to these type of shifts taking place. So is there anyone who can help me just kind of thinking about what my video lecture was on? What was the idea of inclusive masculinity? Does anyone want to take a shot at that? And then we'll start to work through this concept of hybrid masculinity. What was this whole inclusive masculinity about? Which is really the most optimistic reading. Sociologists are usually not that optimistic. This is an example of a sociologist, someone who studies gender and sexuality, saying, hey, here's something that's good that's happening, and I'm going to theorize it as such. So what was Eric Anderson and all the people who followed him? A lot of British scholars, actually, are the ones who use this. Um, but what were they arguing? Anyone want to take a shot? I can try. Yeah, go for it. Um, I think the inclusive masculinity aspect of it was really about changes in the power structure and the dominant forms or having multiple dominant forms versus this kind of singular hegemonic form and everything else being kind of lower in the power structure. So it's recognizing that masculinity takes on multiple forms and each one holds the same amount of power as the other versions instead of or at least potentially could them. right yeah this yes. is this is really good yeah because the key thing with hegemonic masculinity is connell's putting forth this idea of multiple masculinities many different ways to perform masculinity being field specific 
but some get some get greater access to institutions and power, right? So you have Anderson coming along and saying, hey, just what Trevor helped us understand is maybe that power ranking isn't so clear. Maybe you can have multiple forms of masculinity exist that see the differences and acknowledge each other. And you could still map them out in society. But he says there's more orthodox forms of masculinity. That's the term that he uses, which means kind of traditional, that type of stuff we often describe as hegemonic, and that there's more inclusive forms, but there's not necessarily, it's not an either or, right? It's not one above, one below. Both can exist at the same time. So people can come up and there can be people in the orthodox position that still critique people who perform an inclusive masculinity. There can be people in inclusive masculinity that uh, critique those in uh, traditional orthodox, but there's not a pressure to conform to that other type. That's what he's arguing. And he's saying with that comes a greater freedom to find your identity, to find your performance. So he looks at all these different places and he says, look, you know, there's these soccer players who engage in more intimate relationships with their friends and are not worried about touching each other, expressing affection. There's men becoming more open with their emotions. There's men engaging in practices uh, that would have called into question their sexuality or called into question their their attachment to hegemonic masculinity in the past. There's all this type of stuff happening at all these different levels. So he's saying, hey, this is a sign that something good is happening. He also presents us with the term homo hysteria. And that's really key for Anderson because what he's saying is, no, it's not what Connell said, that masculinity, the hegemonic masculinity is defined by homophobia. He's saying it's only defined by homophobia in times of homo hysteria, specific moments in society where there's a fear of other, of other types of sexuality. Right. So he's trying to make a contrast. So that's a pretty positive reading. Now, people have called into question Eric Anderson's work, and we'll talk a little bit about how. Um, and I'm curious what you think, especially when you get to the point where you talk about what models fit. But then there's another answer, right? Instead of so, does everyone understand the idea of inclusive masculinity? I should pause for a second. Is that argument making sense? We can we can talk about whether we fully agree with it, um, what potential critiques are, but first, does it make sense? So we've got hegemonic and we have inclusive. Inclusive, in a sense, is saying hegemonic made sense, but it's shifted. Is there anything I need to clarify? I'm getting from the people on the video, it seems like you're good. That's the only reason that I really like the video on is because I can see if you're following along. I can see looks of confusion or agreement. I'm going to go on because I haven't heard anyone. You can, all right, cool. And you can respond to the chat or whatever is easiest. All right, then we have hybrid masculinity. Hybrid masculinity can be traced back, at least a term, to 1993. The scholar Michael Mesner, and what he's looking at is um, these kind of shifts and movement among men, um, kind of pushing against some of the norms of traditional masculinity. And so we'll talk about, I'll talk a little bit about exactly what he was looking at. But if we want to have a definition of hybrid masculinity, um, what I wrote down is hybrid masculinity is looking at the process through which men strategically borrow from distinct configurations of gender practice. And I can, I'll repeat that and explain it a little bit. But if we want to understand what hybrid masculinity is, the definition we get back in the early 90s is it's this process through which men strategically the word strategic is key. They strategically borrow from distinct, word distinct is key, configurations of gender practice. So basically what Mesner is looking at is all these gender projects, specifically men engaging in these gender projects, that involve selectively taking elements from other masculine identities, right? So there's multiple masculinities, and he's looking at these, these examples Usually, specifically, actually specifically, look at people in with some position of privilege, borrowing or taking elements of masculinity or gender performance, usually from subordinate and marginalized groups. An example of this could be the uh, the what would be some good examples? I mean, an obvious one would be white young white culture borrowing more and more from rap, hip hop culture, right? Kind of taking selectively some elements from that. Sometimes strategically, sometimes very selectively, right? But taking aspects of it, a group with a position of privilege, borrowing these ele elements of culture. Um, 
Bridges and Pasco, more specifically, they don't talk about race as much, but they're looking more specifically at taking what they term sexual aesthetics, right? Rather than the aesthetics that we associate based on race or ethnic category or cultures that go along with race or ethnicity, instead of sexual aesthetics, borrowing certain elements that would be associated with those that are not necessarily straight, right? And that's the point, that's what Eric Anderson was looking at too, right? He's saying with this term metrosexual, which was kind of interesting, some of your responses to that. Um, he's looking at this term metrosexual, which is this movement where you, this shift in like the late 90s, early 2000s, where it's men simply caring about how they look in a way that previously people would have said, that's not something that straight men do to that, to wearing, uh, just using lotion to keep your skin clean and youthful or soft, right? So doing those type of activities, borrowing aspect, uh, wearing certain types of pants, go, wearing, having certain haircuts, taking fashion elements. Um, how many of you know the show uh, Queer Eye for a Straight Guy? So that show came back. Did that show come back like a year or two ago? There was like a return to that show. When that show, when the, I think that I can't remember, like started recording new episodes. I, I didn't follow that closely. When that show first came out, this was seen as this huge moment. Now, most of you, I'm guessing, just kind of take it as like, who cares? There's a million shows like that, that do that type of thing, right? But at this moment, this was this move towards people engaging in either, Anderson would call it inclusive masculinity, uh, um, Pasco and Bridges would call it hybrid masculinity, selectively borrowing from other groups. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this, usually in sociology, research is done on groups who are marginalized or subordinate having to adapt to the group in power. This is an example of groups in power adapting to those below. And we'll talk about whether it's forced or not that the, because of the power dynamic, but still it's groups, power, privileged groups, taking aesthetics, taking certain cultural practices, whether it's music, whether it's fashion, whether it's uh, um, ways of interacting with each other from groups that are marginalized or subordinate. So that's how it, that's what, that's what hybrid masculinity is. Now, now let's try to think about what it actually does or means. And then you'll help me out a little bit with the reading. So I don't just talk the whole time. They are basically saying, this story is not as happy as inclusive masculinity. Because as groups, as this hybrid culture emerges, which seems like a potentially good thing, right? That's why Anderson's celebrating it. Pasco and Bridges are saying, no, there's a danger in that it actually hides privilege and it doesn't actually disrupt the system. It might look like it's disrupting the system, but it's not. And they're saying there's a bunch of research that can support this type of thing. Now, we're going to look through the ways that they say it doesn't necessarily disrupt the system. That's the part you're going to help me with. Um, but before we get there, let's think about what people are doing right now. So they're saying we're looking at the world and we're saying a change is happening. There's a shift in what type of masculinity is being accepted. Now, as people see this shift, there's three ways to respond to it. The first way is what Connell says. So Connell, the person who came up with hegemonic masculinity, sees people like Eric Anderson writing articles, pointing out these shifts. Connell's response is saying, hey, that's a real shift, but it's only in very local specific instances. That's how Connell responds. Connell would say, okay, Eric Anderson, what you're pointing out is real, that boys are more willing to have these intimate, intimate friendships with each other, or you can even see practices like he points out that there were, uh, you know, some in a fraternity culture at one of the places he studied, there's some of the guys who would be willing to kiss each other, but they identified as straight, but they didn't see it as something that they should avoid or that there was a stigma attached. And Connell says, sure, that's great. You're pointing out real changes, but look, you're, you're pointing at affluent white kids in England. That's what you're pointing to. And so you're finding these very local things that are happening, but that doesn't really show that there's a huge cultural shift and you're kind of exaggerating what's going on. Anderson says he acknowledges that, but, and that, but that the shift actually is widespread, but that's Connell's critique. You're only looking at specific instances. Um, and I think there's a lot of evidence that there's truth in that, right? If we were seeing inclusive masculinity threat really spread throughout society, we would see a drop in stigma, a drop in people's willingness to come out as being gay. And that's why I ended the lecture, the video lecture with, there was a moment, there was a, a what was seen as a big moment in the sports world yesterday where a professional soccer player, player revealed that an active professional soccer player talked about being gay, came out, 
And he's the first to do it at that level in European soccer. So if it was as spread as widespread as we think, we would see more examples of this, right? How many professional basketball players in the United States have come out as gay while being active players? Does anyone know? Trevor's holding up his finger one. Yeah, the answer is one. Jason Collins, and he was in the NBA for one year after, after he came out. Not because, because he was about to retire, not because he was forced out of the league. The league was actually very supportive. But he waited until his almost, he was almost retired to come out. No one else has. Other players have come out after, right? And it's also interesting because a lot of the players have said they were not only afraid to talk to their teammates, although some of them felt that their teammates would be supportive, but they were more afraid of just the larger attention that it would receive in society, some of the fan backlash. How many professional football players have come out while they're playing? Anyone? Currently, there's only one that's like um, in the league and like openly out, I think. Oh, who's that? Can you check? I was going to say zero. Um, because I know Michael Sam came out, but then that went the, during the draft, we never actually only got to play on the practice team. He never actually made it to the league. I don't believe there's an active player. Um, so check that in baseball. We only have one. Uh, I don't think anyone in the NHL professional soccer. We've got, I think, I think two players, the numbers are very, very small and it's often zero. Right. And so we know X players, uh, just looking at the chat. B, uh, big. Bad I was gonna Michigan. say. Yeah. I was gonna say um, Ryan O'Callaghan, who played for the Patriots, I believe. Did he come um, out while he was an active player, though, or after he retired? No, but he was like during his time there, and um, there was an interview oh, when they were okay. interviewing about the whole Aaron Hernandez incident. Yeah. And, how they said that there was alleged like um uh, what's the word alleged rumors that Aaron Hernandez was homosexual himself too but wasn't open but yeah during the interview Ryan was talking about how he like didn't mention it at all throughout his time and career and um yeah yeah so we have some ex-players we have Carl Nassif what team is he on do you know Trevor it was the Raiders. Raiders? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. He just came out last year, right? In 2021. 2021. Okay. Yeah. So, again, we have very we have very small numbers. So, the point here is that, yes, there's this change happening that Eric Anderson is pointing to, but Connell would say, you know, how widespread is this? How open is, how open are we actually as a society? Has inclusive, mas if inclusive masculinity, if we reach this point of inclusive masculinity, yes, it's field specific. Yes, it's culturally specific. But the evidence points to it. We're not as open as you're, you're suggesting we are. So one response is to say that's just a local change. Second response is to say, no, this is a widespread change. That's the inclusive masculinity model. Things are actually changing. Sure, they're slow. Sure, it appear it goes at different paces and different. And there's going to be sometimes uh, there's going to be an ebb of flow of progress, but it's happening. The third example, the third response, which is what hybrid masculinity does, is say, no, this actually shows the flexibility of power to adapt to changes in society. So those are the three ways we can we can respond. We know changes are happening in society. One answer is to say it's more local and specific to geographic regions or uh, or class background or educational background. Um, so it's not widespread. Second is to say it actually is widespread. Society is changing. Third is to say no. This is just the flexibility power. The power map still remains. Um, an example of that, and this is, uh, and then I'll have you help me out. So Michael Mesner came up with the term hybrid masculinity. He was looking at these men's movements of the 1980s that I've referred to a few times. Um, what happened was there were a lot of affluent guys, usually white, who started talking about how men's emotions have been very restricted, right? How there's been an inability to, um, to share feelings, whether it's happy, whether it's sad, about how men don't have enough friendship with other men seemingly these progressive things, right? But what Mesner pointed out is there's a lot more style than substance here, right? So a lot of the men would go and do these things. They would take traditional practices. This is where this whole thing about men going off to sweat lodges um, and going like hanging out and kind of having these like spiritual awakenings. Um, there was, if you ever heard of the book, Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus, 
This was during the era. So while the men were pointing to engage in this kind of more emotional masculinity, they were still relying on very strict gender norms. They're basically saying we could be better men, we could be good men, but separating that out completely. They're in a sense saying we could do a better job of masculinity, but separating that from, from women's roles. They almost wanted a more traditional gender roles. They weren't pushing against certain, they weren't pushing against the pressures of society. Um, they came up with this idea of toxic masculinity, basically saying there are some bad men, but we're not that, right? So Mesner looks at this and he says, okay, is this actually doing anything other than trying to return to traditional gender roles with just like a slightly new twist on it? That was his critique of it. Um, so he came up with this idea of hybrid masculinity. Yes, it's borrowing elements from other cultures. Yes, it's borrowing elements from subordinate masculinity, but it's not actually disrupting the norm. It's not actually creating any space for anyone to be anyone. So Pasco and Bridges pick up on this a number of years later when they, when they continue with this term hybrid masculinity. And they say, okay, let's look what actually is happening with hybrid masculinity. They're trying to explain why they think it is not doing the thing that Eric Anderson says, why it's not just a good force in society. They're not saying it's completely bad, but they're saying there's some problems with it, especially when these three things happen. So on page 250, and this is where we're gonna spend the rest of the class working through, and we have, perfect, we've got 20 minutes left. Or no, we've got 25 minutes left, right? Um, we're going to work through these three ideas from page 250. They say that what happens in hybrid masculinity is discursive distancing, strategic borrowing, and fortifying boundaries. And so we want to understand each of those three concepts. The first one, discursive distancing, might be the most useful, I think, as we look at things that are happening in society. Both of all of them are really important. But I think for me, discursive distancing is the most important concept. Um, so... Let's take a moment. We can all look at our screens, which is nice about being on Zoom. You can look at your computer. Gabby, you're not driving, are you? You're just sitting in your car. Okay. Um, don't. No, I'm okay, cool. Your seat. <laughs> okay. Um, so take a look at the reading, if you can, on page 250. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of time um, to try to figure out what we mean by discursive distancing. And then I want to go around and have some people help me out and just tell me what they think this means. I'll also say we should probably have, we had one quiz. We haven't had a quiz for a bit. Let's have a quiz next week when I'm back, probably on Wednesday. And in terms of what you need to know for the quiz, um, it would be all associated with these models, right? So hegemonic masculinity, what are the four types of masculinity that Connell refers to? What are the two different types of violence? Um, then we would have inclusive masculinity. What are the two terms that, that Anderson uses? Orthodox and inclusive, right? Knowing what those mean. And then here we've got hybrid masculinity. And these are the three terms you really need to know. Discursive, distancing, strategic borrowing, fortifying boundaries. So let's have a let's have an easy quiz next week, just making sure we understand those terms. But now let's work through them. So start with discursive distancing. Take a look at it. Try to come up with a definition and write it down. And let's say in five, I'll give you four or five minutes and then let's check in and make sure we understand it. If you're happy with your definition, you can always throw it in the chat and then I can take a look at it too, or I'll have people volunteer.
there's a lot in this page or so on 250 through 251, but try to figure out how to put it in your own words, what's going on. Well, also, just because uh, I don't want to forget, if you already submitted an idea for the final project, but another one comes to mind, feel free to submit it. I'll add it to the list. Um, for instance, we just talked about athletes coming out as being gay. It would be a really good final project to look at when those athletes came out, look at the language they use, um, look at what they talk about, uh, what barriers they had, if this story has any type of pattern. Um, so there's lots of good, there's constantly new topics emerging. All right, help me out. Um, just make sure we get through all three of these terms. How do we understand this? We've got some good, we have some good answers in the chat. Some of the answers are still pretty complicated too, but they're all actually, they're all really good, but they're still pretty complicated. How do we understand this? Someone um, raise their hand maybe. Who's willing to try to put into words? And also make sure to look at the ones in chat because they're good. What's the word discur what's the word discursive mean? What does that even not don't give me a definition because I don't even know if I could define it well. It's used in so many different ways, and um there's some different theories that draw on it and present it in a different way. But what does the word discursive generally refer to? Like if you talk about discourse. What 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 is that? What if if we're engaging in discourse? What are we doing? If there's a discourse around something, is discourse in action? What is it? Just jump in. No need to raise your hand. What is what is? If there's a discourse. What is it on? What's it about? What does that mean? If there's a discourse on a topic. Maybe like a public opinion. It's getting close. It's kind of like a, it's like a kind of like a, what, Meredith? Opposing. Oh yeah, there we got some answers and wait, it's good. Yeah, sorry, I keep interrupting you. Can you say it again? Oh my gosh. Like, yeah, opposing opinions and like kind of um, talking to reach some sort of agreement. Yeah, okay, so that's the key part. It's a way of talking about things, right? There's different discourses on a topic. So the key thing is it's a way, it's a, it's a it's a way of having discussion. A discourse around something could be the scientific discourse about something, the religious discourse about something. It's a model for talking about something. So we need to if we're trying to understand a key term, we should know what's going on. So discursive distancing, we've got a way of talking about something, right? A type of discussion that takes place a type of language that around an idea and it's a discursive distancing so what is the distancing from people in the chat had it right
What's the distancing from? And you could say hegemonic masculinity, but people, which is a good answer, but are people in society using the term hegemonic masculinity? If there's a person doing, uh, like the examples here, engaging in uh, one of these walks for women's rights, so they put on heels and everyone laughs and they and they walk for a little while and they laugh about how awkward it is. Or if it's a person who, um, I don't know, wears a safety pin to show that they're a safe person to talk to about a specific issue, what are they distancing themselves from? Because it's not, if you ask them, they're not going to be like hegemonic masculinity. What are they going to say? Like, don't get caught up in the article. Just think about in your own, what it, like, what are people doing? We're not critiquing them at this point. Yeah, from, from I'm not a bad guy, toxic masculinity, right? That's what it's basically saying. It's saying, look, I'm a good person. So it is effectively establishing, this is a discursive distancing. All these acts, what they're saying is it allows people to show I am, I'm simply not doing that thing, right? It's reaffirming it's reaffirming their position in society, but saying, I am a good person. I am able to engage in this hybrid masculinity. I can do these, I can do these things that show I'm not toxic, that show I'm not bad, that show I'm good, but I'm not really challenging the system, right? I'm just saying that I'm not the one perpetuating it. So that's the first thing they point out that discursive distancing potentially does. And again, a lot of the things that we use here, these three qualities, you could really think about how this relates to race as well. Um, if you're if you're interested in studying power and race, all three of these, that same type of thing occurs with this hybridization of culture. Are you actually challenging things or are you simply distancing yourself from the people who do that? Well, I'm not one of those racist people, right? Look, because I showed up at that event or I voted this particular way. And they're not saying that those things are bad, right? It's not Bridges and Pasco are not saying yeah, participating, walking a mile, a mile in her shoes march, that's a bad thing to do. Um, to embrace some more open emotional aspects. They're, saying, they're not saying that's a bad thing to do, but they're saying the danger of this is that people simply engage in these acts and then don't take seriously the power of the system and instead say, well, there's those bad people out there, but we're one of the good people. This occurs in other areas too, right? We could look at something like policing. So instead of say, instead of asking why is it that certain things happen in the relationship between police and the general population, instead just saying, "Oh, well, I'm one of the good police, right? I'm one of the good police. That's those bad things that happen. Here's be, I'm good because I interact with the community. I'm good because there's a video of me uh, dancing or shooting basketball with kids, or like, or Grace has put it's like the not all men argument. Exactly, it's distancing yourself and not taking seriously." the larger says like what why is this pattern repeat over and over um so that's the first thing that potentially happens discursive distancing second thing we'll speed up now because we got 10 minutes left strategic borrowing this one um is this comparable to implicit masculinity in any way i'm going to come back to that question gabby let's go through let's get through all three and then i'll answer that um so next next one um strategic borrowing Anyone want to take a shot at this without going back to the reading? I mean, we could even look. Let's even just look at what the terms mean. So strategic, what does that mean? If you're strategic and doing something. Yeah, it's pretty good. I like, I like Trevor's definition. Um, very pointed in your choice, uh, taking element, elements of other masculines, and it doesn't even have to be masculinity, just taking elements, it's borrowing culturally, right? Cherry picking is, yeah, that's the easiest way to think about it, I like Meredith's word. It's taking just aspects from another culture. And if we're thinking about what I said in the previous page, it's often from either subordinate or marginalized group, right? So you could think about, think about racial aesthetics or sexual aesthetics. So it's taking these elements, elements from that culture now, they are not saying there should not be cultural exchange, but why are they critiquing it in the case of hybrid masculinity? It's taking elements from a culture, but what's being ignored?
I want to say what it like why why would anyone ever critique it okay part of what's being ignored is the privilege to do that right because not everyone can simply take from other cultures so that's part of it what else is being ignored privilege is a big part of it what else When we're looking at a cult, if we're taking from, a, uh, yeah, the culture itself, that's a good way to think about it. The history, the history of the culture itself, right? And it could be about racial aspects, could be sexual aspects, it could be anything, right? But if you're taking from a subordinate or marginalized group, what's being ignored is how these cultural practices link to the larger culture, but also the struggle that went along with it, right? In borrowing from a culture, one of the reasons that they point out this is is, is a problem is, if someone who is straight is simply taking on some of these sexual aesthetics from, say, gay culture, taking elements of it, it's ignoring the whole history of struggle, the way that groups have been oppressed as a result of this. And by taking on that struct that those practices, it engages in discursive distancing, saying, well, like I'm not, I'm like the not like those other guys, because look, I can take these elements of this culture. But it's not taking any of the risk that goes along with it. It's not acknowledging the history. And because of strategic borrowing, it can also be given up at any time at any time. Right. Miley Cyrus received a lot of critiques for this as an example. Miley Cyrus coming up is the daughter of a famous musician. So very wealthy. A lot of the practices, a lot of her performances took very heavily from black culture. Right. So she was kind of celebrated for doing that. And then suddenly she just gives it up and has an album where she's suddenly more like uh, like psychedelic hippie, or she gives it up and she has is in a video wearing all white and like very pure, right? You can go through these phases and take them as you want and then leave them behind, right? While others have to struggle and get punished for those pr presentations. So they're saying that's the danger so far. It's distancing yourself in hybrid masculinity, right? And presenting these new types of masculinity. It's distancing yourself from all those guys who are conservative and bad and like we're not like them it's borrowing elements from the culture without fully taking seriously what those things attach to and then the third thing which i think is probably less i think the first two are incredibly common and we could see it everywhere but the third one uh is important to understand as well the idea of fortifying boundaries so what does that mean we got five minutes left let's figure out what that means Yeah, I think it, it definitely relates to privilege, like what Grace wrote, but what does it mean? What does the term fortify mean? If you drink milk, it has, if you drink, um, if you drink soy milk, they add calcium because it does this to your bones. What is it? Yeah, it strengthens, right? So fortify is, is to strengthen and then about, so if, it, it actually strengthens boundaries. So it's interesting because in a sense, what's happening, think about the example of, actually, I really like the example of the, the walks that people engage in, walk a mile in her shoes, where these, these progressive men put on high heels and walk, and maybe sometimes even wear skirts or dresses. Um, you see this all the time at like Halloween. Um, in doing that, they're distancing themselves, right? They're saying, look, we're good people. We're showing up for this event. We're borrowing aspects of culture, although it's not that they're not making heels part of their identity because they're not actually take their their distancing themselves from that culture as they're doing it. But how is it fortifying boundaries? Because it's showing, well, look how ridiculous it is for us to wear this type of thing. We would never do such a thing. And when we do it, it's just it's just comic and it's a joke, right? We're establishing there's a boundary, even as we're trying to play with that boundary. Um, an example would be. Um, taking on certain fashion elements that would be more associated with gay culture, but then at the same time as doing that, doing things to also establish, no, but I'm doing this as someone who is straight. Um, whether it's through using certain terminology, whether it's through, often it's through humor is a way to deflect and establish boundaries. Um, are all the, are these concepts making sense? These three concepts? 
Okay, does anyone have examples of this? We've got four minutes left. Can anyone think of cultural practices or language, especially in your in the younger generations that we see where we see this happening? It could be in pop culture, it could be in social media. Oh yeah, going to, exact going to a gay bar is a really good example. We could see all this stuff happening, right? I can't be homophobic. I go and hang out at a gay bar. Like I'm very supportive of that culture, right? Um, I'm even going to borrow certain elements as I go there, but then you go there and it's saying, well, I'm also, I'm doing this as a straight person. I will, I will, I like being in this space, but if someone wants to hit on me, if someone actually interested in thing, no, like, well, I have to establish, I'm not that I'm actually so straight. People even try to, this, this can be part of the logic. I'm so straight that I can go into these spaces. It's actually a very traditionally masculine thing that I can enter this space and I don't have to worry about my sexuality. Right. So that's an interesting way where it seems to be hybrid masculinity, but we can see it doing all three of these things. And again, Pascal and Bridges would say none of these practices are necessarily bad. When does it actually become bad? Actually, let's end with that point. When is it actually bad? Because they would say. Oh, that's interesting. Matt. You could see a ton of stuff on social media. That would be an interesting project for, for final project. When is it bad, though? Why do they think this is dangerous? Because they don't think that hybrid masculinity, okay, even more. So when it doesn't challenge a system, but even more than that. Yeah, that would be part of it when the cultural appreciation becomes cultural appropriation. But why is it bad? That would be bad too. You're all listing things that would be bad, but why do they think that that hybrid masculinity is so dangerous? upholds privilege okay uh jonathan is actually the closest to being right now but why i mean you're all you're all right so far but why is it that hyper masculinity is so dangerous because it seems it seems potentially really good the idea of cultures merging seems like that would lead to greater acceptance which it kind of does okay i'll just say um the danger they think is that it actually better masks the power dynamic, right? Because it, without hybrid masculinity, you can easily point and say, that's the group of power. That's the group that's being marginalized. That's the group that's subordinate and being punished. That's the group that's complicit and doesn't actually get full access, but they still benefit. With hybrid masculinity, it actually hides those arrangements and it can make it more difficult to detangle. This is one of the problems when you have... Um, situations where the supposed good guy is still upholding the patriarchal system, upholding power arrangements. Sometimes it's easier to be able to point to the person and be like, yeah, they clearly don't support these things. They are someone I can argue against. It's harder to argue against hybrid masculinity because it's hard to untangle who's actually working against the system or who's actually engaging in these three types of things. So that's the argument they're putting forward. Um, Okay, so that's where we're going to end today. So we, we've had hegemonic masculinity, we've had inclusives, we've had hybrid. Next class, we're going to come back and try to make sure we understand these three. Uh, make sure to do the in-class writing. And then you have a short reading for next class, which is based on, uh, which is an article that I wrote with a scholar in Australia. And we'll try to make sense of a, a completely different way to understand masculinity. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, I have recorded this. I will share this lecture. If any of you want to go back to make sure you understand it, um, I'll have it saved on YouTube so you can watch anytime, but make sure you're all caught up. That's the plan for Friday. If you're a discussion leader, um, submit your writings and you'll, and I'll still give you grades based on those. Um, if any of you have your questions, just stick around or raise your hand and I'll call you. Haley briefly had her hand up, but it switched to a party hat. So I don't know if she has a question, um, but yeah, that's it. So feel free to stick around if you have questions. Um, otherwise, I will see you on Friday and stay healthy, everyone. And just let me know if you're sick or from this class or anything like that. Um, I have a question about the discussion.